All right, all right. Happy Easter Sunday, guys. My special guest today is Kim Iverson. She is the host of The Kim Iverson Show. Welcome back, Kim. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great to celebrate Easter with you. I know it's interesting. Like so many people were like, you know, that Sunday is Easter, right? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't have any plans. <laughs> so I know. Right. My husband is going to cook uh, a, a, an Easter dinner later tonight. So we're going to have lamb, you know, which I think is a traditional Easter dish. He's really big on holidays. He already colored his eggs. He did. <laughs> he colors the eggs. He carves the pumpkins. He decorates the Christmas tree. He does all of that every single year. So we have a little bit of Easter spirit going on here. Awesome. Well, you just, someone said in the chat that uh, you just recently had a birthday. I did. Yes. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Once you hit a certain age, the birthdays are not something to, <laughs> to celebrate. Yeah. I just, I just had my birthday. Uh, Thursday was my birthday. Cool. Yeah. Did you do anything fun? My husband took me to a really, really nice dinner. So I, I did, I live streamed with, um, I live, I did a live stream birthday party on my locals channel. So that was a lot of fun. And then later after, and then I did my show. So I actually did, I worked that day. And then, uh, after that, my husband did take me to a really, really fancy, super fancy dinner here in LA at a place called Providence, which is like an ultra, you know, we don't do things like that. I've never been to anything like that in my life. It's like a two Michelin star restaurant. He's a foodie. So he's really into that, but for me, I'd never been into to anything like that ever in my life, and uh, it was it was like art, like the, where the food is tiny, but it's like art, and it was absolutely delicious. It's like amazing that humans can make food that's that delicate, but it's it's a you know we don't do things like that ever. Normally, my birthday is like karaoke and pizza, but, mm -hmm. but this year we we did do it up a bit, so that was fun. That's awesome. So yeah. I want to start off with uh, with RFK because um, I'm sure you know that RFK Jr. has decided to make his uh, announcement for VP. I want to start off with a little bit, a, a little short clip from that of him making that announcement, and then I want to get your opinion about this. Why I'm so proud to introduce to you the next Vice President of the United States. My fellow lawyer, a brilliant scientist, technologist, a fierce warrior mom, Nicole Shanahan. That, of course, was Robert F. Kennedy Jr. this afternoon in Oakland announcing Nicole Shanahan as his 2024 running mate. Shanahan is a... Okay. So, Kim, you have been uh, pretty vocal on Twitter <laughs> about his uh, pick... Uh, Nicole Shanahan. I, I want to hear from you. Uh, what do you think about him making this choice for his VP? I think a lot of people were assuming he was going to pick someone like a Tulsi Gabbard or Jesse Ventura. Yeah. Or, you know, a Rand Paul would have been a killer ticket um, or a Thomas Massey. Even I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of people out there who I think have been truly fighting the establishment for a really long time. And it would have been nice to see a pair of true anti-establishment warriors get up there on the state, you know, really joining a ticket together. So I've been vocal about this, not only on Twitter, but on my show, much to the chagrin of the people that love RFK Jr. They're, they have, they're still very committed to his campaign, um, not really willing to criticize him. I've kind of given up on him since the Israel stuff. I, I don't understand his his stance and his, his support for Israel, but whatever. Um, this pick in particular... There's two big problems I have with this pick. The first big problem is she's a major top three donor to his campaign. And that just looks like you could buy your way in. So that's not good. Um, whether so let's let's just assume she is the right pick, that it was like a vet, uh, like a Rand Paul who happened to be a top three donor to his campaign. Even if the person is excellent for the job, it's a really bad look that they're also a top donor to your campaign because it just looks like you could buy your slot into the administration. Very Betsy DeVos and Trump. I mean, very, um, we, we see this with the swamp. That's the problem with the swamp. One of the main issues is that they just give slots away to top donors. So we don't really want to see that happening in an RFK Jr. administration, especially when he's saying he's fighting the establishment. He's going to be different than the rest. This just looks very akin to being the same as the rest. So that's the first thing. Even if she's great for the job, it's not a good look to select somebody who is a top donor to your campaign. She may be the top donor. Uh, she certainly is a top three donor. 
Um, the second chapter is one thing that I've been discussing online, on Twitter, and on my show is what I call being battle tested. And this phrase has caught a lot of flack because a lot of people will say, well, Nicole is a fierce mom, as Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said. She's a fierce mom. She has an autistic kid. She's uh, She came from poverty. So she has life tough life experience. That is not what I mean when I say she hasn't been battle tested. It's great that she's had a tough life. Like, you know, that is definitely better than somebody who's just been fed with a silver spoon their entire lives, like Kennedy. <laughs> but it's, you know, so it's, it's nice that she's come from, you know, kind of a rags to riches story. Uh, understand that she's got a kid that she's been fighting for in their, in their health journey, their medical health journey. All of that is great. But a lot of people do that. And a lot of people are not aligned with us. They're not aligned just because you came from rags to riches, just because you have a child with medical condition does not make you suddenly anti-establishment. It doesn't make you suddenly wanting to rise up against uh, all the corruption. I mean, practically everybody in California is somebody who's got a rags to riches story and who has a kid with with it, who's immunocompromised. We heard that all throughout the pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, it was like the Californians who were sitting there screaming, my kid is immunocompromised and you're trying to kill him because you don't want to mandate vaccines. I mean, we heard this time and time again. So parents dealing with children with medical conditions is common in a place, in, in liberal places in particular, because they're more likely to say my kid has a problem than maybe yep. a lot of conservative areas that are less likely to blame everything on something, right? So that doesn't, and, and she's a Californian, so that doesn't make her suddenly aligned with the anti-establishment populist values when plenty of Californians are not, and they have the same background as Nicole. So when I say battle tested, I mean somebody who has actually gone up against the establishment, has, has sacrificed and been willing to sacrifice against the smears, the labeling, the, estab the, the threats that the establishment gives you. I mean, she has been part of the establishment and then she says on the on the stage, a year ago, a year ago, that's convenient, a year ago when COVID was over, right? A year ago, I learned about Bobby and I liked him. Oh, I, you know, I read all these conspiracy theories about him and I thought, oh, but then I met him and I thought, oh, he's actually a great guy. Convenient a year ago to suddenly say, oh, uh, yeah, you know, this guy actually was right. What is difficult is were you with him three, four years ago? Not a year ago. Were you with him three, four years ago? when you were called a conspiracy theorist, when your job was on the line, when you lost family and friends. I had family members not attend my wedding, close fam sister not show up to my own wedding because of my views on COVID. I lost my job because I because of censorship. You know, there's, there's many people had, that's what I mean by battle tested. Are you willing to hold firm at all odds when you're about to lose everything and when the establishment is coming barreling towards you. I was labeled a conspiracy theorist by the Daily Beast twice, right? They wrote two articles on me calling me a conspiracy theorist. Are you still, when I was on the Hill talking about COVID stuff, are you willing to stand firm to it, whether, and it doesn't matter if you agreed with me on COVID or not, right? It's about whether or not you're willing to be the type of person who's going to stand up against all odds, potentially losing everything because of what you believe in. And we haven't seen that from her. So she's not battle tested. And if you're going to be vice president, that is RFK Jr.'s personal pick for who would stand in as president of the United States if something were to happen to him, which he's fully aware might happen. I mean, he talks about that's why he's asking for Secret Service. That's why, you know, he talks about the assassinations of his dad and his uncle. So you've got somebody who knows there's a real risk of his life being lost battling the establishment. He's had that happen in his own family. And yet his personal pick for the person who would secede him is somebody who hasn't been battle tested. I have a huge problem with that. And it's somebody who then is a huge donor to his campaign. I'm like, okay, well then we just know that whoever writes the biggest check is the person you think can actually succeed you as president of the United States if something were to happen to you. Great. So basically no different than everybody else. Yeah. 
This is what, <laughs> this is something that I, I, I have been trying to explain to people who are supporting RFK Jr. Obviously the Israel, his position on Israel and Gaza, obviously, but I've been trying to tell people for quite some time. I'm like, guys, look at where his money is coming from. He's getting money from Bill Ackman. He's billionaire. He's in bed with like the tech bros in Silicon Valley. Uh, she was in bed with the tech, literally. Oh, and <laughs> by the way, all three of her husband, I mean, and look like, I, I, the, the, the biggest, the biggest outspoken, mo loudest outspoken people I know against Israel are Jewish. So I don't mean this in any like, oh, look, they're Jewish, but they are Jewish. Her, her ex, her three ex-husbands are Jewish. In my three. experience, all three, right? Yeah. So she had the first husband who was Jewish. Uh, she had no children with him. But they got a divorce and then she married the second guy, the Google guy. The first guy was also rich, but he wasn't as rich. He was like, I don't know, $25 million, something like that. And then married the second guy who was a billionaire. And then she married this third guy who is like on the list for like the best. I mean, he's like on all of these lists of top Jewish people to watch, uh, rising up, you know, very uh, all through, you know, um, like, and again, that's, that doesn't mean you're a Zionist by any means. Like my, I have the, the, the loudest voices I know against Israel are Jewish people, but mm -hmm. The reality of it is, is that the majority are very pro-Israel. I mean, that's just the numbers. The numbers are the numbers. So the the numbers, the number game is that she's got a daughter who's half Jewish. She has, um, you know, so there is, so she's probably, when you look at, you know, when we're looking at the process of deduction of like how, what's her stance on Israel is the point. Uh, her stance on yeah, looking at Robert F. Kennedy and his stance on Israel, he's a, according to Dennis Kucinich, who I just interviewed the other day, who was his campaign manager. Dennis Kucinich says, you will not find a stauncher, stronger supporter for Israel than RFK Jr. Why? Who knows? Nobody knows. But he's like their staunchest supporter. So you take that and then you take, obviously, his VP pick would probably also be a very staunch supporter for Israel would be a deduction to make. And then when you look at her ex-husbands and see that they're all Jewish and that her daughter is half Jewish, you then make a further deduction that she's probably knowing that most Jewish people are pro-Israel, not all, of course, uh, but most are, are pro-Israel, if not full-on Zionist, then, I, which I don't think, in looking at her husbands, at least the Google guy's not. I don't think he's like a staunch, I don't, from what I, I but I could be wrong on that. He might be. He's super secular, but that doesn't mean anything either when it comes to Zionism. So, you know, I mean, process of deduction, she's she's ultra probably Zionist, right? I mean, using those three, using all of those, using those, you know, as the process of deduction. I mean, I'm trying to figure out how you get married three times at her because she's 38. She's well, yeah, the last one is in a technical marriage. They did a love ceremony, but she wore a wedding dress. I mean, it was like. I, maybe maybe it is actually a technical marriage because they might have actually done the paperwork. They didn't call it a wedding. They had a love ceremony, but she was. It was like an expensive event. She wore an expensive gown. You know, it was very much like a wedding. I don't know but, if they're technically married. But I don't. I don't know if everyone remembers this. But I covered this uh, at some point last year. Sergey Brin. He was subpoenaed by, you know, under the Epstein case. He was su subpoenaed. And then there's that. <laughs> I mean, so it just doesn't look good. And then with RFK Jr., you know, especially with his two trips on the Epstein plane, right, on the Lolita Express, uh, it just so happens that all the people that could corroborate why he was there, why he wasn't there, are dead. Epstein and his ex-wife. You know, that's, I mean, I don't mean to be harsh, but about his ex-wife being, you know, because she is dead. She committed suicide. And Epstein's obviously dead, who supposedly committed suicide didn't commit suicide. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, and then he says, well, I was just there because we were going on like, I don't know, what was it? They were like rock hunting <laughs> trips or something, something odd. Right. Falcon, Falcon, something. This yeah. Thing twice. That it, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and with RFK Jr. Having a less than, I mean, the guy, it was a bad dude for a long time. He was a bad dude. There's just no other way to say it. The guy was hooked on drugs he was sleeping around with a lot of women, including while he was still married. He was sleeping with three women a day when he was married to another woman. Like, this is not a high moral character at certain times of his life. That doesn't, now people can change. I have nothing against that. Um, 
people, you know, I, I've been a big supporter of his. I, I, I'm a, I was a big, huge, art with despite his past, because I do think people can change, especially when they get out of drugs. I think drugs are a really bad thing. And that alters a person's decision making. But, you know, you put all that to, especially at that time when he was doing all that stuff and he was on Epstein's Lolita Express twice, that doesn't look good. And then you've got now the, the VP pick somehow being entangled and all. I mean, it just doesn't, it's just adding up to no good is what it's adding up to. Do you find it strange, too, that uh, she actually identified herself as a progressive, which is really interesting, uh, and she's donated to Democrat politicians. Some people uh, on Twitter that were RFK supporters, they said, oh, this just proves that RFK is still a Democrat. What do you think about that? I think it's true that it proves he's still a Democrat. I think it's really clear what he's doing is... So I thought when he chose to run as an independent, which I told him when he was on my show a couple of times, I've, I, I grilled him at one point. And I was like, why are you running as a Democrat? You're never going to, this is like the worst political decision to run as a Democrat. And he's like, Kim, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. I want to reform the Democratic Party. I'm a Democrat through and through to my core. And ultimately he then abandoned that and became an independent. I thought when he became an independent, when he ran as an independent, he saw a real path as an independent to potentially bust the two party system. With his selection, though, of Nicole Shanahan, it actually looks like he's trying to bust the Democratic Party. So what he's trying to do is he realizes that Joe Biden is uh, like out. Nobody wants Joe Biden. But the Democratic Party's in this situation. How do they finagle their way out of that, of the sitting president? They can't really do that. Uh, so they're kind of in between a rock and a hard place. And I almost think there might even be there might even be collusion, to be honest with you, between the DNC and RFK Jr., where they're like, okay, we have to play hardball like we don't like you, but in reality, we don't like Biden. We can't have Biden. So what we're going to hmm. do is we're going to, you know, run as an independent. Why don't you run as an independent, gather as much of the popular vote as you can as a Kennedy and selecting a woman of color? You know, this was like obviously a, uh, what do they call it? A, a diversity pick, Right. Because here's somebody that has, which is not bad. She has no experience. We want outsiders. But, I mean, she's clearly a diversity pick. There were plenty of other people that he could have selected who would have been anti-establishment warriors. But he picked a Kamala Harris, you know, cutout, but somebody way better than Kamala for a Democrat. I mean, a Democratic voter doesn't like Joe Biden and they don't like Kamala Harris. Well, now you have an alternative. You have a Kennedy, a historic Kennedy, and you've got, Shanahan, this young, vibrant, you know, uh, loves kit, just everything she talks about exudes something that Democratic voters are going to be really hot for. No, not independents and not Republicans, that's for sure. The fact he selected her, knowing it would turn off every single Republican potential voter, shows to me he's actually trying to topple the Democratic Party, but now he's doing it from the outside. So he's doing what he was originally saying he wanted to do which was change the Democratic Party back to the party, the Kennedy Democrats. He realized he couldn't do it from within. So now he's doing it from the outside. But it's still just a reformation of the Democratic Party. I don't know if I would call it a, a, a diversity pick. I would call it a money pick because she has a lot of money. I think With that's what he's kind of looking at on top of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, more of a money pick for sure. Yeah. But how did he go from, I I'm just curious because at one point it seemed like he was going to pick someone like Tulsi or pick Tulsi Gabbard. So how did he go from, <laughs> from Tulsi Gabbard to her? It seems like Tulsi would be more aligned with what RFK platform is. Um, it's just, it's kind of weird to me, but I did see a number of people on Twitter kind of, they were really upset that he didn't pick uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Well, I, I don't think Tulsi wanted to be picked. So Tulsi, the reports were that Tulsi had stopped cooperating with the campaign. So she has instead flipped fully for Trump and she's trying to get the Trump VP pick. And I think the Trump what? people told her, yeah, yeah, she's in line for potentially the Trump VP pick. Um, I think she was told she's a careerist. Look, I, you know, I'm super, Tulsi's my number one disappointment. Um, I mean, RFK Jr. is probably second. I don't know. It's hard to, hard to hard to line them up anymore these days, but she's a big disappointment to me, huge disappointment to me. She's a careerist. It's very clear. She's just out for political, political gain and money, to be quite honest. I have a big beef with her on how she uh, received funding after she stopped being a member of Congress. She started to um, 
get people over to a, a, you know, she created a locals community and basically funneled all of the donations she was getting for her campaign, which could not be used personally instead over to a locals community, which she could use personally. And she was getting, I mean, maybe even close to a million, you know, I don't know, like a lot of money, maybe a half a million. There was a lot of money funneling into that account that, um, to me was the thing I hate about politicians is how they become wealthy and they shouldn't be, you know, everybody wonders how is a politician wealthy? Well, they're not really wealthy because of being a politician. They're wealthy because they do things after or during the time in politics in order to make a boatload of cash because that's really what they're all about. And so she really disappointed me. But anyway, I think she's all about um, political success and she's willing to flip flop her positions and her views in order to gain. We already saw that many of us who supported her when she was running as a Democrat in the 2020 election. Um, we made a lot of excuses for her flip-flopping, you know, mm -hmm. trying to excuse the fact that she once held quite Republican conservative viewpoints on certain topics or quite um, problematic viewpoints on topics such as torture, such as gay marriage, such as, um, you know, there was several of these types of topics. We made numerous numbers of excuses for her saying, well, she changed, she opened her eyes. She's kind of like what people are saying about Nicole, like, oh, well, she's she saw the light. And so here she is. And then Tulsi now has flipped back. You know, now she's suddenly back to being an ultra conservative and and going back on all the things that we sat there making excuses. She made a fool out of us, made a fool out of a lot of us, out of myself, out of Jimmy Dore, out of, you know, there were a lot of us that she made a fool out of and um, made Anna Kasperian right. You mm -hmm. know, we sat there and defended her against Anna Kasperian, who was smearing her. And in the end, Anna was right. And that was a hard pill to swallow for a lot of us. Um, we didn't want to see it because we fell in love with a politician. I'll never do that again. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. you know, Tulsi is in line for Trump's VP pick. So that's, she stopped cooperating with RFK Jr. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I learned my lesson after Bernie Sanders. I said, I can't, no, 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 <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. And then even after, uh, for the 2024 election, all the, like the independent and third party, there are a number of people that said you should volunteer for this. I said, no, I'm not volunteering for any more. After Bernie Sanders, I said, I was done. That's it. Yeah. I'm not doing this again. Yeah. I really, you know, RFK Jr.'s campaign did at one point start kind of putting the feelers out for me, uh, towards me about certain positions within his campaign. And I pretty much told them whenever they'd put the feelers out, I'm not, I, because I, I, I want the ability to turn on him <laughs> if he does something that makes me turn on him. And I didn't, you know, at that point I had not known there was no, the, the Israel Gaza issue wasn't an issue. He hadn't said anything. This was prior to all of that. And I'm glad I, I glad I said what I said, which is I, I need the ability to turn on the guy because <laughs> I turned on the guy, you know? He, yeah. he made bad position. He, he's got a stance that I, I think gets us into endless wars in the Middle East. And that's the crux of the issue for a lot of us. He's flip-flopped on some of his policies too. When you spoke to him or when was the last time you've actually had a chance to have a conversation with him? Have you spoken to him since he said that Palestinians were pampered? No, I have not. Mm -mm. The last I spoke to him, I had two conversations with him earlier in the year of last year. So one of them was back before he even announced he was running for president. It was, there was no discussion of that. And then after he made his announcement, uh, he came on my show like that same week, basically. And we talked about his policy positions as, as a, as a contender, but we didn't get into Israel. Right. Um, uh, should have. I know. I know. I know. Well, I'm asking because Jill Stein actually uh, tweeted voters should be clear on where every candidate for president stands more than two uh, months into Israel's brutal assault on Gaza. RFK Jr. said that Palestinians are the most pampered people by international aid organizations on the planet. Since then, RFK Jr. has continued his unrepentant uh, reflexive praise and support for Israel as the death toll has climbed to more than 30 K. I am challenging RFK jr. On his assertion that Palestinians are pampered and that Gaza should be leveled sign now and tell Kennedy to debate me on Palestine. Yeah. And I wanted to get your opinion. What do you think about that? Jill Stein's awesome. Here's a Jewish woman, right? This is a Jewish woman 
And she is telling RFK Jr., who we don't know why he he's a Catholic. So that's not a Zionist. Catholics aren't Zionists. That's not that's evangelical Mormons. Yeah. There are certain sects of Christianity that are Zionist, but Catholicism is not one of them. So it's odd that he has the stance that he has about Israel. And here's Jill Stein taking him to task on it. Um, he absolutely should be debating her on that issue. I think that she'll be the other largest third party candidate besides RFK Jr. If she gets the Green Party nomination, which I think she will. Um, and so he should actually debate her. I mean, he's unwilling to. He, he, he's sitting there upset that Biden won't debate him, but he won't debate anybody else. He refused to be on the debate stage with Jill Stein and others at the um, the what, what is it? The free and fair elections. Yeah, so he refused or he just didn't respond because refused. I know they said they. I mean, they'd hmm. asked him numerous times. I mean, if failing to respond is equal to refusing when they asked him in person. <laughs> you know, they, they've seen him in person. They've seen people in his campaign in person. It wasn't just he didn't respond to an email or something. I mean, they tried numerous times and they, they had contact with all the right people. And he just, um, yeah, didn't respond, which is a refusal in that situation when you've got direct contact with the guy. So how is he going to debate if he gets the percentage, which it looks like he's on track to to get there? If he stays to that 15 percent, I think the last one I just saw showed him at an average of nine percent. But if he has that 15 percent come election time, how is he going to debate Joe Biden and Donald Trump? I don't know. You know, and the, the one thing that's really killing Biden, this is what's really interesting is what's real. I mean, unless age is really the issue for people. And that it's more about age than it is about Israel Gaza. But a lot of the lack of a lot of people turning on Biden in the Democratic Party have been turning because of the Gaza issue, right? Um, but that might not be true. Or they're fully unfamiliar with Kennedy's stance, which is also very possible. That they just the the you know, the media attention is not on Kennedy and his full-fledged support for Israel and calling Palestinians pampered. That is something that I think is more within our circle, but I don't think that's like a mainstream, a mainstream understanding. And so people might think they're getting something different by supporting RFK Jr. than, than Biden, but really they're getting way more of the same on that particular issue. Unless they know that, and it really is just about the cognitive decline of Biden which is a gen, which is also a genuine concern that people should have for sure, you know, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. It would be interesting to see them all three debate. I would love to see all three of them debate about that particular issue. And I think surprisingly out of the, all three of them are ultra super supportive of Israel. You have to remember Trump did move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Trump's son-in-law is Jared Kushner, who is very close friends with Benjamin Netanyahu. In fact, he hosted Benjamin, you know, his family, when Benjamin Netanyahu would come to the States, they, he'd stay at the Kushners and Jared would have to give up his room for Netanyahu to, uh, Netanyahu to take over. And, um, you know, very, very staunch, wrote the Abraham, the Abraham Accords, which is just like a joke, basically putting the Palestinian people into reservations on their own land. Um, so Trump is not any better, but I guess where Trump is slightly better is he recently did an interview with this Israeli organization. And he's like, you guys got to stop this war. <laughs> like you guys have to end. This is not good for you. The world has turned on you. It's not good. I mean, at least Trump cares about optics. That's like the only thing he cares about really is like, what do people think of me and what are the optics? And so that's like the one thing Trump, I don't think is a supporter of anything but himself. And in, mm -hmm. in this particular situation, that's actually a good thing. Because then when everybody turns on him and says, you're a supporter of genocide and how could you be doing this? And Trump would be like, well, I don't want to be that. So I'm going to change my mind. Whereas these other two are like way more, it seems like, um, interested in the, you know, they seem to be more um, like, I don't know, it's, it's like somehow um, ideological or money driven, well, more money driven than anything. They're both Catholics, Biden and, and Kennedy. So I think it's got to be money. Right. And why do you think that he did not? He said he would have a conversation with Max Blumenthal, but he never did. Yet at the same time, he is willing to go on to breaking points and have this same discussion about Israel and Gaza. So why is he willing, you think, to go on to breaking points and have that conversation? And Crystal pushes back on him about this as well, but he's not willing to have that conversation with someone like Max Blumenthal. 
Well, I think because Max would, he knows that Max would just um, take it, you know, Max is uh, much harder to debate on that issue than Crystal. Mm. Interesting yeah. times we are living in. So I, I want to get to the free speech issue because I'm pretty sure you've heard about this uh, spat between uh, Candace Owens and the Daily Wire. Also, uh, Ben Shapiro's in the mix here, too. What do you think this means about conservatives that for, I would say for the past couple of years have said that uh, we practice free speech and you should be able to say whatever you want. <laughs> and now you have the Daily Wire uh, doing what they did to Candace Owens. Do you feel that the right has now lost credibility, at least when it comes to the free speech issue and why or why not? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously when it comes to this, it, it just goes to show that the right is free speech unless you criticize Israel. I think everybody in this country should start waking up to that um, the issue of, of them and like, why is Israel so powerful? Why do we have anti-BDS laws? You know, there's a lot of that going on right now. I'm sorry. One second. I am, uh, in the middle of a slight emergency that I'm trying to handle. Just, oh, no worries. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. I'm hoping my husband can handle it instead of me. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, I think the right has definitely lost, um, for sure, you know, and, and everybody, you know, we have anti-BDS laws. Anti so you're not allowed to support the boycott, divestment, and sanctioning of Israel in 37 states in this country. It was 27 states in 2019. Since 2019, 10 more states have joined on to this most of them in 2021. So, you know, we've got this, everybody in this country should start asking some serious questions about, imagine if that were China, if, if we had these laws again with protecting China. Imagine if the Daily Wire said, you can criticize everybody but China. I mean, people would be up in arms about this. So we need to start asking questions as to why is this foreign Middle Eastern country so powerful that it is the one country, I mean, we have free speech in this country except with Israel. Yeah. I keep telling people it's supposed to be the United States of America, not the United States of Israel. But it's very clear, like, who comes first? Look at what just happened with Governor Abbott. He just made an executive order that they're going to create safe spaces for you know, for, for Jewish students. And my whole thing is, is like, you were totally against safe spaces for other groups. Now all of a sudden it's okay to have safe spaces. So it is very obvious, I think to anyone who's paying attention that they are choosing to prioritize uh, and no shade to Jewish people, but they are choosing to prioritize a certain group of people over everybody else in this country. And it's just, right. it's, very frustrating to me, especially considering all the money that comes in from the lobbyists, like groups like APAC, all the people that are taking money from APAC. I mean, Jamal Bowman is out there right now on Twitter telling people that Hakeem Jeffries endorsed him and he's happy to get the endorsement. Jamal Bowman is a part of Reject APAC. And I'm like, why are you, why are you bragging that Hakeem Jeffries is endorsing you when he takes a lot of money from APAC, the very thing you're supposed to be fighting against? It's laughable at this point. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a really, it's a really, um, there's, I, we just really have to start asking a lot of questions about this. I think more, you know, there, a lot of us understand that there's just a huge amount of money and power. And it's not just the APAC lobby. There's people that are not donating directly to APAC, but they're, they are still very powerful and influential, very powerful and influential Jewish people who are very pro-Israel and who will pull their money from campaigns or they'll put money towards, uh, you know, challengers to campaigns. So it's not just APAC. It's like an entire, um, it's like a web of, of people and interests that are aligned on the same thing, which is Israel. And it's really should cause everybody to ask a lot of questions about that where that influence is coming. It's it's tricky though because so many of them are Americans. So they're Amer in fact when Israel started as a country, um, the year that they that they formed as a nation was there was a flood of money that came in humanitarian money that went towards Israel. All of it coming from the United States of America, and it was actually the largest amount of humanitarian aid. It was I don't know if you'd call it humanitarian aid, but it was like the largest donation that had ever been given 
ever to any organization ever. And it was fundraised by very wealthy Jewish Americans who, you know, this was before APAC or anything like that. So this was Jewish, just wealthy Jewish Americans who wanted to see the, the state of Israel created. And, uh, and then also non-Jewish Americans who are evangelicals who believe that in order for Jesus Christ to come back for the second coming, that there needed to be, um, the, that the Jews must have an actual literal gathering of Israel. They need to return back to Jerusalem in order for the second coming to happen. It needs to happen literally in the evangelical mind. In the minds of Christian, like Catholics and other groups, it's not literal. It's like, it's, it's like a, it's, it's like a spiritual kind of thing that needs to happen. But right. for some, it's, it's like an actual literal thing. So there's just a ton of money. And I think everybody should start asking questions on that. And it's not anti-Semitic to ask those questions. And they make us feel like it's anti-Semitic to ask those questions. They make us feel like it's anti-Semitic to call out wealthy Jewish business owners in America or just wealthy Jewish Americans who are donating billions of dollars or throwing billions of dollars around. You know, they make that, they make us feel like, they make us feel like that's anti-Semitic when it's, when it's not at all. It's just fact. It's just the way that it is. Right. And I think that, you know, for people who may not have had this experience, it's true for those of us that grew up uh, Christian, that is exactly what they taught us in church, that those things needed to happen. Uh, So I I would argue there's probably more Christian Zionists than there are uh, Jewish Zionists in the United States. Are the, the money, right. There are, there actually, that is a known fact. There is a the organization that is not APAC, but it's basically evangelical Zionists, you know, that are supporting the state of Israel. There are, they're for sure more numerous. I just don't know if they're wealthier. I don't know if they have more money. That That's where the numbers and the money kind of, there's questions there. Yeah. One more question for you, Kim. Um, you have covered Jeffrey Epstein uh, numerous times on your show This whole uh, debacle that is coming about now with uh, Diddy and apparently they're claiming that other people could be attached to this uh, similar situation where his house was just raided because of by Homeland Security uh, in reference to a sex trafficking uh, investigation. Do you think there's any possibility, and this is something I've just been running through in my head, that this Epstein situation is actually bigger than what we were told it was. And do you believe that maybe there could be some connection here with someone like Diddy and possibly others that just haven't been caught yet? Um, I don't know if there's any connection. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be like cross, you know, if Diddy's running a, a, a blackmail sex ring and Epstein was, you're, and they're all dealing with very powerful people, you're probably going to see people that are kind of entangled in both. I'm not sure if there was any cross or if there was any, I don't, I don't think Diddy, for example, was working on behalf of the state of Israel like I think Epstein was. I think Epstein's operation was very specific in that he was an asset for Mossad. And it looks that his handler was Ghislaine Maxwell, whose father was a big member of Mossad. And so that looks like a very specific reason for why that, not just Mossad, it looks like then Epstein was probably used by other organizations who were like, oh, that's clever. Let's, you know, like the CIA. <laughs> He might have been like, oh, let's get in on that too. Like, hey, if you know, if, if he's already set up, like, why not? Why not? Why not utilize this guy? So I do think Epstein was very specific for uh, intelligence services. I don't know if Diddy was. I think Diddy, but it's you know, it what it goes to show is that, um, well, what we know is that in society, you get caught up in sex scandal, then your career could be over. I mean, look at Tiger Woods with the sex scandal that he had to do. You know, that he lost a lot of. It wasn't anything dealing with children or any sort of blackmail operation, but it still cost him quite a bit. We see this with um, Elliot Spritzer, right? There's all these people that get involved. And when the sex stuff comes out, their careers are ruined. So people have, uh, you know, a, a, a reason for wanting to hide things and for wanting to keep that kind of stuff secret. That then is obviously very powerful. It's a powerful blackmail tool. And so I think anybody who's looking for power for any way, might want to use that tool. And then in particular, if they want to use underage and really get you on something that's illegal, then they really could get you. And I, so I don't know if there's any cross there between the two, except that there's they are similar in in what they were trying to achieve, which is blackmail using this, using sex and using underage people. And it's just a showcasing, they're only, they're, they, those two are two of many. 
you know, there are many other operations like this going on. And for their own gain, their own reason. What Diddy's gain was and his reason for doing it, I think was different than Jeffrey Epstein's. I'm, but, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, of course, could be wrong on that. And they could end up having some sort of crossing over in some way. I'm sure there were a lot of the same people involved. But that's because they were all a bunch of perverts, right? Um, I think Diddy could be actually one of the lower people on the totem pole. And it's actually someone bigger over him. Oh, you mean like in that particular scandal? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that one is really weird. That The Diddy stuff, you know, because they're they're accusing him of like killing Tupac, right? Or at least uh, putting out the hit on Tupac. Mm -hmm. And and apparently his ex-girlfriend Cassidy said that he tried to, that he blew up Kid Cudi's car. Yep. Like, this guy is a dangerous dude. I mean, if Diddy is, then, I mean, he's much, well, I think the difference is, it kind of would show with Epstein. Epstein has an entire intelligence organization to cover everything up. You know, what does Diddy got? <laughs> you know, he might have been doing it all for power and fame and and you know the ability to control an industry or keep himself on top of an industry or grow the artists he wanted to grow, you know, all of it for money or something. But in the end, he's gonna come crashing down, just like Weinstein, just like a lot of these guys that were doing it for their own personal gain and their own personal perversions, and not because some intel service was behind them. And I think that's like a huge difference we're seeing between Epstein and like Diddy and Weinstein and all these other, and Cosby, you know, who got themselves caught up in these, in these, um, you know, in, in these types of, I don't even want to, scandal is not even an appropriate word because it's beyond scandal, right? I mean, it's atrocious. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. All right, Kim, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, where can people find you? And do you have anything cool uh, coming up? Well, you can find me on my show. It's Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern at Rum on Rumble. So it's the Kim Iverson Show on Rumble, and I live stream every day. Um, and cool coming up. Well, I do have um, Helga LaRouche coming on tomorrow's show from the LaRouche organ. You know, I'm, I'm speaking to LaRouche herself. So that'll be an interesting conversation about the Oasis plan, about her vision for, I think we need to give more attention to the voices that have plans outside of the current plan that the U.S. military industrial complex has, which is dominate through bullying. And there are people out there with better ideas and better plans of how the U.S. can uh, fit into the world without being a big bully. And so LaRouche is one of those. And so I think it's an important conversation to have. So doing that tomorrow. Interesting. All right, Kim, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy Easter. You too. Bye.